This presentation covers VFR operations and cross-country planning. The mission planning for VFR and IFR cross-country flying does not vary much in terms of preparation, such as checking the weather, NOTAMs, and computing told. It does vary, however, when it comes to operating in controlled airspace. This three-part series will cover those things unique to VFR flight, to include VFR regulations, navigation, airspace, sectional charts, altitude and course planning, creating a navigation log, and flight plans. In this video, we will look at Air Force VFR flight regulations, VFR navigation, and the U.S. airspace system. The primary sources used for this lesson are the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge and the AIM, both produced by the Federal Aviation Administration. Both of the manuals are available for free download at FAA.gov, as well as in your four flight documents. Before we jump into the lesson, a little background on VFR flight. In the very early days of aviation, flight was restricted to times of good visibility and weather. In other words, visual flight only. The pilot maintained visual contact with the ground at all times and used it as a reference point for executing maneuvers. As you probably already know, the Wright brothers made their first flight in 1903. Their aircraft, the Wright Flyer, had only three onboard instruments, a wind speed gauge, an engine RPM tachometer, and a stopwatch. Aircraft in the 1910s navigated solely by following roads, railroad tracks, rivers, and other prominent train features. Over the next three decades, aircraft were gradually outfitted with rudimentary flight instruments, such as the magnetic compass in 1909. It wasn't until September 1929 that Lieutenant James Doolittle of the U.S. Army Air Corps made the first completely blind airplane takeoff, flight, and landing solely by reference to an experimental gyroscopic compass, artificial horizon, and a precision altimeter. Obviously, much has changed since the pioneer days of aviation. However, navigating by visual ground references is still an important skill for pilots to possess, as GPS and ground-based nav aids may not always be available to you on any given flight. Now for the legalities of operating VFR in the Air Force. As you no doubt know, AFI 11-202 Vol 3 spells out general flight rules for Air Force aviators, and there are a handful of regulations in this document regarding VFR flight. Chapter 4 of this regulation dictates VFR and IFR flight rules. First off, in AETC we teach VFR procedures, but operationally most Air Force pilots will fly exclusively IFR. Air Force aircraft that are operated under VFR the most are helicopters, C-130s, C-17s, and Special Operations Aircraft. Per the 11202 Vol 3, pilots are to fly U.S. Air Force fixed-wing aircraft under IFR to the maximum extent practical. Pilots shall fly under IFR if weather conditions do not permit VFR flight. Airspace rules require IFR flight, operating in excess of 180 knots true airspeed within Federal Airways, also known as Victor Airways, or operating fixed-wing aircraft at night unless the mission cannot be flown under IFR. Do not operate under VFR when the flight visibility or cloud clearance is less than basic VFR weather minimums for the airspace operating in. Additionally, do not operate fixed-wing aircraft VFR when the ceiling is less than 1500 feet AGL. Furthermore, utilize ATC flight following when practical. It is joked that VFR stands for very few rules but fly into controlled airspace VFR without ATC clearance, and you'll quickly learn there are, in fact, rules to follow if you value your wings. In the United States, airspace is broken into two general categories, controlled and uncontrolled. Controlled airspace simply means aircraft are controlled by ATC. Pilots wishing to fly VFR in controlled airspace must first contact the controlling agency before entering. In class E and G airspace, Pilots flying VFR are not required to talk to ATC. Weather permitting, aircraft may fly VFR in all airspace except Class A and certain special use airspace to be covered later in this video. Keep in mind pilots operating VFR must adhere to minimum cloud clearances and in-flight visibility for the airspace in which they are flying. Additionally, whether flying VFR or IFR, in controlled or uncontrolled airspace, the pilot is ultimately responsible for terrain, obstacle, and traffic collision avoidance. 
Class A is generally the airspace from 18,000 MSL up to and including flight level 600, including the airspace overlying the waters within 12 nautical miles of the coast. Unless otherwise authorized, all operations in Class A airspace is conducted under instrument flight rules. Class B is generally airspace from the surface to 10,000 feet MSL surrounding the nation's busiest airports. The configuration of each Class B airspace is individually tailored and consists of a surface area and two or more layers, resembling an upside down wedding cake. ATC clearance is required for all aircraft to operate in Class B airspace. VFR aircraft may operate below the Class B shelf without ATC clearance, but they must be squawking 1200 within 30 nautical miles of the airspace's primary airfield. To enter Class Bravo airspace VFR, contact the primary airport's approach control while well clear of the airspace. Once communications are established, provide the controller with your aircraft type, position, altitude, and intentions. It is also common technique to include that you have the ATIS and include the letter identifier. To enter the airspace, approach control must say your call sign and use the verbiage, clear to enter the Class Bravo airspace. To depart the primary airport of the Class Bravo airspace VFR, you must contact clearance delivery and tell them your aircraft type, initial altitude, direction of departure, and destination airport. That controller will provide you with a transponder code, departure frequency, and may give you an altitude restriction or initial heading to fly. Either the clearance delivery controller or tower controller will clear you into the airspace. After reading back the instructions, contact ground control for taxi. If departing a satellite airport under the Class Bravo shelf, you are not cleared into the Class Bravo just because you are cleared for takeoff. After taking off from the satellite airport under Class Bravo, remain at an altitude below the shelf. Flying in Class Bravo airspace may seem intimidating but in reality, it's easier than flying an IFR SID or STAR. In any case, there are a few more rules and requirements for operating VFR within Class B airspace, so be sure to review Chapter 3 of the AIM should you ever wish to operate in the airspace VFR. Class Charlie airspace is generally airspace from the surface to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation. Although the configuration of each Class Charlie area is individually tailored, the airspace usually consists of a surface area with a 5 nautical mile radius and an outer circle with a 10 nautical mile radius that extends from 1,200 feet to 4,000 feet above the airport elevation. Unless otherwise authorized or required by ATC, 200 knots is the maximum indicated airspeed within 4 nautical miles and 2,500 feet AGL of the Class Charlie Airport. Each aircraft must establish and maintain two-way radio communications with approach control prior to entering the airspace. If the controller responds to your radio call with your call sign, standby, radio communications have been established and you can enter the Class Charlie airspace. Most Class Charlie airports have a clearance delivery frequency. Departing from a Class Charlie airport is the same process just explained for Class Bravo VFR departures. Class Delta airspace is generally airspace from the surface to 2,500 feet above the airport elevation surrounding those airports that have an operational control tower. The configuration of each Class Delta airspace is individually tailored. When instrument procedures are published, the airspace is normally designed to contain the procedures. Arrival extensions for instrument approach procedures may be Class Delta or Class Echo airspace. Just like Class Charlie airspace, unless otherwise authorized or required by ATC, 200 knots is the maximum indicated airspeed within 4 nautical miles and 2,500 feet AGL of the Class Delta airport. Often, Class Delta airport control towers do not operate 24 hours a day. When the control tower is closed, the airspace reverts to Class Echo. Unless otherwise authorized, aircraft must establish and maintain two-way radio communications with tower control prior to entering the airspace. On initial contact with the tower controller, provide your aircraft type, position, altitude, and intentions. Typically, Class Delta airports do not have a clearance delivery. To depart a Class D airport VFR, squawk 1200, contact ground control for taxi, and say your direction of departure. A large amount of the airspace over mainland United States and within 12 nautical miles of the coast 
is designated as Class Echo airspace. Class Echo provides sufficient airspace for the safe control and separation of aircraft during IFR operations. While Class Echo airspace is categorized as controlled airspace, pilots flying VFR are not required to talk to ATC while flying in this airspace. Class Echo airspace typically starts either at the Earth's surface, 700 feet AGL, or 1200 feet AGL, and extends up to, but not including, 18,000 feet MSL. All airspace above flight level 600 is Class Echo airspace. It used to be Class Echo airspace often began above 1200 feet AGL in sparsely populated areas of the United States. But over recent years, nearly all of the high Class Echo and Gulf airspace over land has been eliminated. The image on the right depicts three non-towered airfields. Class Echo airspace at the southernmost airport, circled in yellow, starts at the surface and extends to 18,000 feet MSL. This is depicted by a magenta segmented circle. The airfield in the center, circled in green, is a Class Golf airfield at the surface. At this airfield, Class Echo begins at 700 feet AGL and extends to 18,000 feet MSL. This is depicted by the shaded magenta enclosure around the airfield. Inside the faded portion of the enclosure, Class Echo starts at 700 feet AGL. On the solid side of the border, Class Echo begins at 1200 feet AGL. For the North Airfield, circled in blue, Class Echo begins over the airfield at 1200 feet AGL. The airspace from the surface to 1200 feet AGL is Class Golf. Class Golf airspace is uncontrolled and extends from the surface to the base of the overlying Class Echo airspace. Golf airspace is primarily used by VFR aircraft, but some IFR traffic may transit it while climbing or descending to an uncontrolled airfield. Only a few years ago, Class Golf airspace could be found in sparsely populated portions of the United States, from the surface to 14,500 feet MSL. Over just the past couple years, Virtually all of these areas have been restructured as Class Echo, starting at 1,200 feet AGL. Special Use Airspace is the designation for airspace in which certain activities must be confined, or where limitations may be imposed on aircraft operations that are not part of those activities. While VFR, flight within these areas are either prohibited or inadvisable. In general, it is best to stay well clear of these areas. Prohibited areas contain airspace of defined dimensions within which the flight of aircraft is prohibited for both IFR and VFR traffic. Such areas are established for security or other reasons associated with national welfare. Restricted areas are areas where operations are hazardous to non-participating aircraft and contain airspace within which the flight of aircraft, while not wholly prohibited, is subject to restrictions. If the restricted area is not active and has been released to the FAA, the ATC facility allows aircraft to operate in the restricted airspace without issuing specific clearance for it to do so. If the restricted area is active and has not been released, the ATC facility issues a clearance that ensures that aircraft avoid the restricted airspace. Restricted area information can be obtained on the border of the sectional chart or with foreflight by holding your finger on the area to bring up airspace information. Warning areas are similar in nature to restricted areas. However, the United States government does not have sole jurisdiction over the airspace. A warning area is airspace of defined dimensions extending from three nautical miles outward from the coast of the United States, containing activity that may be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. The purpose of such areas is to warn non-participating aircraft of potential danger. MOAs consist of airspace with defined vertical and lateral limits established for the purpose of separating certain military training activities from IFR traffic. Whenever a MOA is being used, non-participating IFR traffic may be cleared through the MOA if IFR separation can be provided by ATC. Otherwise, ATC reroutes or restricts non-participating IFR traffic. VFR traffic, on the other hand, is free to transit MOAs without restriction, and often will do so without inquiring with ATC if the MOA is active or cold. 
Alert areas are depicted on sectional charts to inform non-participating pilots of areas that may contain a high volume of pilot training or an unusual type of aerial activity. Pilots should exercise caution in alert areas. All activity within an alert area shall be conducted in accordance with regulations, without waiver, and pilots of participating aircraft, as well as pilots transitioning the area, shall be equally responsible for collision avoidance. Controlled firing areas contain activities that, if not conducted in a controlled environment, could be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. The difference between CFAs and other special use airspace is that activities must be suspended when a spotter aircraft, radar, or ground lookout position indicates an aircraft might be approaching the area. CFAs are not depicted on sectional charts. Other airspace areas found on sectional charts include military training routes, permanent TFRs, parachute jumping areas, terminal radar service areas, air defense identification zones, and wildlife areas. Military training routes are low altitude corridors utilized by military aircraft. Slow speed routes are flown at 1500 feet AGL and below and are not depicted on sectional charts. VFR and IFR routes have published altitudes found in the AP-1B and are depicted on sectional charts. TFRs are just as their name describes. They are areas where flight is temporarily prohibited for the safety of the public or to aircraft authorized to operate in those areas. Temporary TFRs are not published on sectional charts, such as those found over large sporting events, air shows, and wildfires. There are a few permanent TFRs throughout the United States, such as over Disneyland. Be sure to check NOTAMs and overlay TFRs on Sky Vector and ForeFlight for your route of flight. Parachute and glider operations frequently conducted in the vicinity of airfields are depicted on sectional charts. Be sure to monitor the CTAF frequency of those airfields when flying near them so you know when to stay well clear of the area when those operations are being conducted. Terses are areas where participating pilots can receive additional radar services. The purpose of the service is to provide separation between all IFR operations and participating VFR aircraft. The primary airport within the TERSA becomes Class Delta airspace. TERSAs are depicted on VFR sectional charts and terminal area charts with a solid black line and altitudes for each segment. The Class Delta portion is charted with a blue segmented line. Participation in TERSA services is voluntary, however, Pilots operating under VFR are encouraged to contact the radar approach control and take advantage of the TERSA service. National security areas consist of airspace of defined vertical and lateral dimensions established at locations where there is a requirement for increased security and safety of ground facilities. Aircraft operating in these areas must have an operable Mode C transponder and maintain two-way communications with ATC. Wildlife areas and national parks are depicted in blue on sectional charts as seen here. Pilots are requested to operate above 2,000 feet AGL over these areas. This concludes part one of VFR operations and cross-country planning. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of the requirements to fly VFR in the Air Force and within the U.S. National Airspace System. In part two of this series, we will look at aeronautical sectional charts, learn how to determine navigational courses, and learn about visual navigation.